This is Anesthesia Circuit with John Kenny, a resource for the busy anesthesia provider and the only show dedicated to all things anesthesia. Hello and welcome to Rapid Sequence Information, a special edition of Anesthesia Circuit with John Kenny. The purpose of Rapid Sequence Information is to give you a seven minute uh, review of a high yield topic. Today's RSI topic is anesthesia in patients with renal failure. Let's get right into it. So we know that the primary functions of the kidney are going to be filtration, absorption, secretion, and excretion, among other things. Now when a patient comes into the pre-op area who has renal failure, there's a couple of questions that you want to ask um, every patient um, with ESRD especially. Um, so, uh, you want to ask them if they're on dialysis, what type, um, when they were last dialyzed, and where their access location is. Now, um, you also want to ask about fluid restrictions and urine output. Um, you want to know their dry weight and their current weight. If they're hypovolemic, you um, remember that a patient can have life-threatening hypotension with the vasodilatory and um, cardiac suppressant effects or cardiac depressant effects of the anesthetics. Um, you want to know what their electrolytes are. Uh, especially potassium, and you want to know if there are any medications that are given during dialysis that may not be on their medication list. Now, there is multi-organ system dysfunction with, uh, in concurrent with renal failure, um, and so there's some things that you want to keep in mind when any patient comes in. So cardiovascularly, they're at much higher risk for um, atherosclerosis. Um, their accelerated atherosclerosis is uh, secondary to disordered glucose and fat metab metabolism. They're also at risk for uh, CHF, pulmonary hypertension, and arrhythmias. Um, also hypertension, um, which is associated with uh, left ventricular hypertrophy as well. Now from uh, the hematologic standpoint, they're uh, predisposed to coagulopathy secondary to uh, thrombo uh, thrombocytopathia. Um, and now this is because uremia interferes with the von Willenbrand factor and factor eight release from the endothelium. So the treatment, typically, you know, you're gonna start with DDAVP, platelets, and cryo um, if it's uremic um, coagulopathy. Now, there's also anemia um, in these patients and it's secondary to low erythropoietin and decreased red blood cell survival. Now, um, when it comes to pulmonary, um, they're at higher risk for pulmonary edema, and this is because of low albumin um, and oncotic pressure. There's also low surfactant because of um, decreased albumin, decreased or, or poor nutrition, and this increases their likelihood for atelectasis. Now, when it comes to immune system, they're uh, susceptible to infection secondary to uremia, anemia, and poor nutrition as well, so be careful with that. Um, for GI, there are aspiration risk as well. Um, neurologically, they're at risk for uh, uremic encephalopathy as well as peripheral neuropathy. So if you're considering doing a nerve block, um, you want to know if this patient has any numbness and tingling already in that area. Anesthetic consideration. So for lines, you never want to place a central line on the same side as the AV fistula. Also, you don't want to access the AV fistula or dialysis catheter unless it's an absolute emergency. And try not to place a peripheral line on the extremity with the AV fistula as well. For fluids, patients uh, with ESRD or acute renal failure are at higher risk for fluid overload. Be aware of the fluid, vol uh, fluid volume and type. For minor procedures and stable patients, keep fluids under about one milligram, um, I'm sorry, one milliliter per kilogram. Um, and use normal saline or half normal saline depending on what the patient's plasma sodium is. Uh, typically lactated ringers is avoided because of the uh, potassium component um, in, uh, in the lactated ringers. Now it's normal physiologic uh, potassium that's in lactated ringers, but there have been cases of patients having um, hyper, uh, hyperkalemia with uh, the administration of lactated ringers. Um, for electrolytes, um, renal failure patients are at higher risk for hyponatremia intra-op, especially if they're receiving hypotonic solutions. Um, they're at risk for hyperkalemia, as we mentioned. Um, each institution has their own cutoff uh, for you know, treating this. Some are 5.5, others are six mil milli equivalents per liter. Um, if uh, EKG changes seen with Hyperkalemia include peak T waves as uh, with shortened QR in interval, and these are usually the first two findings: peak T waves, shortened Q, uh, QT, sorry, interval. 
Then, uh, then there's a lengthening of the PR interval and QRS duration. The P wave may disappear and ultimately the QRS widens further into a sine wave pattern. Um, treatment uh, of hyperkalemia includes regular insulin, calcium, bicarbonate, beta agonists like albuterol. Insulin drives, uh, drives intracellular uptake of potassium. Um, it's usually administered with dextrose. Calcium gluconate does not affect the serum potassium levels, but it does stabilize the myocardium and it prevents arrhythmia. Sodium bicarbonate helps drive potassium intracellularly, intracellularly as well. Um, and it goes with the rule that potassium follows the hydrogen ion or acid. Um, calcium gluconate, especially if there's EKG changes are seen, um, stabilizes the uh, myocardium as we mentioned. Um, and what I wanted to mention is that um, Calcium is more available in the calcium chloride form than the calcium gluconate form, so typically more calcium glucate, gluconate is needed. So think about calcium channel blockers rather than going to an ACE inhibitor or beta blocker um, to treat hypertension. In the hemorrhage scenario, remember that antigen exposure due to transfusion is important because it may limit the number of donor matches for our renal failure patients. So if you're considering transfusing, you really want to weigh those risks and benefits. If you decide to uh, transfuse, consider the volume reduced and also washed leukocyte reduced RBCs. Beware of the potential uh, citrate toxicity as well because citrate is excreted in the kidneys. The induction dose of drugs uh, of propofol is not altered much by ESRD, but barbiturates um, are particularly dependent on renal elimination, um, and so they need a decreased maintenance dose. Um, increased unbound fractions um, of thiopental, methylhexatol, and diazepam are seen, and so you may need less for that initial bolus dose because there's gonna be a, a higher initial plasma levels or um, uh, available drug in those cases. Uh, inhaled anesthetics, in, uh, including nitrous oxide, are okay in renal failure. Remember that compound A um, has been shown to develop in animal models in low-flow sevoflurane um, anesthetics. Um, it hasn't been shown in human models, but typically people will keep their flows at uh, 2 liters per minute to help avoid the buildup of compound A. Um, for neuromuscular blockers, succinylcholine results in a transient rise of potassium between 0.5 and 1 milliequivalents per liter. Remember that. Um, vecuronium has been shown to be prolonged in renal failure. Rocuronium, the data is actually mixed on that. And remember that Sugamidex is not recommended um, for creatinine clearance less than 30 milliliters per minute. Um, uh, and so, um, and when it's above that and there's um, renal failure, that it's uh, a reduced recommendation. Now, atricurium and sits atricurium are uh, okay in renal failure as they undergo Hoffman elimination. When it comes to opioids, short acting like fentanyl, rem remifentanyl are typically used. Methadone is also safe in renal failure patients. Um, most antibiotics are dependent on renal elimination, including cephalosporins. So, you want to, when you're redosing, you want to check with your pharmacist or um, um, check uh, online resources for the for the redose. Um, now, when it comes to uh, drugs, um, they're metabolites. Now, morphine has um, uh, active metabolites like mor morphine three glucuronide, morphine six glucuronide as well. Uh, meparidine has normeparidine as a metabolite, and that actually can cause seizures. Um, diazepam cause uh, oxazepam, which is sedative, um, has sedative properties. Um, midazolam um, has a metabolite of 1-hydroxymidazolam, which is also sedating. Nitroprusside has thiocyanate, thi thiocyanate as a metabolite, um, which is neurotoxic. Um, vacuronium as well um, has a metabolite which has a relaxant effect. All right, thank you for joining me today for Rapid Sequence Information, a special edition of Anesthesia Circuit with John Kenny. I'm John Kenny, and this is the only station dedicated to all things anesthesia. See you next time. Information disseminated in this show are for entertainment purposes only. Please consult your professional societies for the most up-to-date information on practice guidelines. Kenny's Anesthesia Circuit is a Vigilant Medicine Media production. Copyright Vigilant Medicine Media 2018.